Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session of a China Economic Outlook, uh, collaborated by the World Economic Forum and Itai Media Group. So uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you and also uh, our great panel today for this uh, very uh, uh, important and interesting topic. So China's economic growth uh, of last year is 6.6%, which is the uh, slowest since the 1990. And also China's growth is expected to, uh, to be 6.2% uh, 6 in the 2019 and the 2020 by the IMF. So how are the uh, domestic and global factors will shape China's economic outlook down the road is the main thing we're going to talk about this uh, today. So uh, we have a, a great and powerful panel today with us. So um, to my left, um, Mr. Glenn Yunki, uh, he is the uh, Yung Yonki? Yonki. Yonki. Yes. He's the uh, uh, co-CEO of the Carlyle Group and a uh, uh, huge uh, uh, PE group and everyone knows. And uh, next to him, um, Ms. Jin Ke Yu. Uh, she's a professor of the uh, economics of the LSE, United Kingdom, and also a very um, brilliant uh, young economist on the global stage. And uh, uh, next to her, and uh, John Zhao, he's the chairman of the C and the CEO of the Honey Capital in China. Honey is a, a very uh, powerful PE uh, company in, in China, do a lot of the M&A and a lot of other issues in, for the SOE and also for the private uh, economy. And next to him, uh, Tim Adams, mm -hmm. president and CEO of the IIF, mm -hmm. a very powerful uh, finance uh, institute in, in, in the global, uh, global stage. And uh, last but not least, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Fang Xinghai, and uh, vice chairman of the CSRC in China. And also, uh, Xinghai had a, uh, had a very good uh, comment, uh, comment uh, comments uh, yesterday and today and mm -hmm. on China's role in, 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 in the world. So um, let me start with a, a very short and a very interesting survey for our five panelists. I mentioned that the, uh, China grow at 6.6%. So the perception to this data are different within China and outside China. Within inside China and some may, uh, um, commentator and also some media celebrate that the, uh, because this growth number amounts to uh, 90 trillion of the RMB in China is first time to amount to this, uh, this amount of GDP. And also this type of the GDP contribute to 30% of the global growth. So it's a, a good news. But the rest of the world, are, uh, some of the rest of the world, I should say, are deeply worried about China's economic growth outlook this year and also next year. Mm -hmm. um, they think that the China will slow further and will drag the uh, world economy and also the global financial markets. So a very um, quickly survey for all of you. Do you think this worry is justified? No? <laughs> so, maybe could you, you, you have a view here? Uh, Very quickly. There's no doubt that the Chinese economy is slowing down. I think there's some confusion as to why it is slowing down. Um, a few years ago, uh, including uh, this uh, audience, was very concerned about the financial vulnerability of the Chinese economy. And since then, in the last two years, the government has really vamped up its efforts in uh, implementing deleveraging uh, efforts. And we have seen leverage really stabilize or even come down in various sectors. So uh, for me, it's slower but safer. And I, I think that's right. It's self-engineered, right? We shouldn't be surprised by the headlines, and for the right reasons, in a more sustainable trajectory. But certainly, it's been a pronounced decline. I think what uh, what markets are looking at is the overlay of trade tensions with the U.S. Yeah. or tensions globally, and does that exacerbate uh, the decline in a way in which we didn't fully appreciate, given the self-engineered nature? Even at a six percent rate of the size uh, is fairly <coughs> rapid growth. It will continue to mm -hmm. contribute significantly to the world growth. But for China, I think it's time for quality, mm -hmm. growth in structure, uh, and also inclusiveness. And that takes time. So I think quality is the policy orientation and the market wants. Yeah, I, I do think that it's important, though, to recognize that today's China is very different than China 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the contributor to GDP growth, which historically was all export driven, is now very much internal consumption driven. 
And so what we saw really in the fourth quarter, um, and it showed up in the economic data, and we have a very large uh, portfolio in China, was that the consumer um, was nervous. Um, and so when you take an environment where you have trade disputes um, that are very well understood, um, and you have a deleveraging that's gone on, and you have a consumer that drives a meaningful part of your economy, it's not surprising that when the consumer gets nervous and spends less, that the economy slows down. Yeah. This, is, this is a very basic input into GDP growth, and we see a new kind of Chinese, Chinese consumer today. Yeah, if we look at the uh, consumption number, uh, which is 9%, is the lowest since the, uh, 2009, right. so it's an issue. So, yeah, so. I mean, a lot of foreign companies who do business in China did see their sales slow down uh, in China last year, particularly in the last quarter. That's where the worries come from, right? Uh, but my message you know, to this audience today is that, uh, uh, yes, China's economy has some short-term challenges, right? Trade dispute, uh, consumption slowdown. But on a medium uh, and to long-term basis, you know, I mean, three to five year, uh, if you look at that horizon, uh, the Chinese economy should be uh, very healthy and uh, should continue to be uh, a huge uh, growth engine uh, for the world. And I'll tell you why a little bit later. Yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, Tim mentioned the trade disputes between China and United States. And also, if you look at analysis on this issue, if you look at the data from IMF, uh, they said that in the worst scenario, it could cut off uh, one6 uh, 5 to 1.6% of the GDP in China, mm. but it's the worst scenario. So we are looking forward to a kind of a deal. So as an American, uh, mm. uh, American investors and also the uh, economists, do you think a, a deal is possible? And what, what kind of the deal we're going to have in your mind? Yeah, I, so first of all, the, the underpinnings of why there's going to be a deal are not because both sides are going to violently agree. What's, the underpinnings are going to be that the heat gets turned up to the point where both sides recognize we need an agreement. Mm. And that is um, going to require uh, more negotiations than we've had just to date. Um, but we actually believe that the compelling nature of reaching a deal in China from an economic standpoint and from an opening up of the, of the Chinese business, uh, business environment and to the United States because it's going to have an immediate impact on global growth and therefore the U.S. economy, we think is going to be compelling. Um, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but we have felt, based on progress to date, that there's no reason why this shouldn't happen by the summertime. Yeah, but the, uh, uh, the message we have uh, uh, received uh, so far is mixed. And we have seen that the uh, um, Secretary uh, Pompeo yesterday is very optimistic of, uh, of this deal. And also uh, President Trump himself just uh, signaled the same uh, sentiment a few days ago. But also we have uh, read some reports saying that the United States now uh, objecting uh, two vice ministers to go to the United States to have a preparation of the uh, talks. So we don't know how will the situation will going on, but we are best hope. Also, some thoughts from well, to, to your point, there's 10% tariffs and $253 billion worth of, of imports. Scheduled to go to 25% March 1st. There's another $267 billion of imports that are potentially subject to tariffs going forward. And the Chinese have put tariffs on 90% of U.S. exports to China. I think we'll get a deal as well. And I think we'll get a deal where, and I think we could have had a deal 18 months ago, actually, where there is, uh, you know, opening the wallet, lots of purchases. If you look at the comparative advantage of the U.S. economy, its energy, its services, its agriculture, and its technology, all the things you need, especially agriculture, U.S. is happy to sell you soybeans any day. And energy, we talked about oil earlier. So I think there's the outlines for a deal. I think the stickier issues, which won't be resolved in the short term, is what do you do about structural changes, SOEs, and their role they play, opening up markets in the technology transfer? You know, there are disputes out of Washington about whether it's forced technology transfer. Uh, Beijing said it's not. But again, I think there's a way to solve that in the short term. I'm with you. I think by summertime, we'll be on the other side of this, uh, partially on the yeah, other side of it. I agree. Well, the truth is uh, nobody wins in a trade war. Uh, and uh, it took a bit of time uh, for people uh, on both sides to recognize that time-tested truth 
Um, so, so it takes a bit of a process, uh, and I agree with Tim. Um, now we're at a point where the harm, both short-term uncertainty and long-term harm, is surfacing. Um, you know, and people start to reflect how we got here. Uh, the fact is, in the last 10, 20 years, both countries benefited from trade and collaboration greatly, uh, and uh, inter interdependency is a fact of life. So we're at a point where we either advance this uh, so that we create win-win situation, or we go backwards and create big-time losers. And, and I think, you know, I'm very optimistic that uh, once we recognize the problem and the severity of that, we're going to move forward. That said, I don't think this is about just the trade imbalance. You know, we've developed our model to the level where there's some structural um, incompetent, you know, it's not compatible. And uh, it's, it's not a simple matter to see which system is right and the other is wrong. Both systems need to adapt to the new reality. We're, we're at an age where globalization is getting to 4.0, yeah. supported by you know, proliferation of um, digital technology and uh, internet. So I, I think we have some work to do, and I'm very confident uh, through time and efforts we're going to work through these structural issues and, and other issues. Yeah, we will go to digitalization a little I, later, but yeah, let's, just, let's just, you know, um, face the reality a little bit. Uh, <laughs> China makes certain concessions, let's say 40% of the items that are demanded, 40% uh, is up for negotiation, 20% is no-go. There will be an endless number of things that U.S. will demand of China to do, even beyond trade, because, um, and I agree with uh, your comments, which is that the trade war is not really just about the trade war. It's about Chinese aspirations, it's about the development model, and eventually it's going to be about Chinese technology. But I just want to bring two facts, which I think um, is, uh, is in enlightening. Uh, when the tariffs increase, um, tariffs on Chinese imports increase for the U.S. It's not that U.S. firms start to uh, import less. They just don't import at all. So there are a lot of zeros in the data that we just recently saw, which means that currently what's happening is that this is really affecting the restructuring of the global supply chain. And there is an enormous amount of cost associated with, okay, I can't work with China, I can't work with Chinese inputs, I need to go and search for other uh, sources. So we're seeing big zeros in the data. Second fact is that um, when the tariffs have increased um, against Chinese imports, actually, U.S. Uh, exports or imports of Chinese um, goods did not decrease as much as the other, other way around because there's more dependence of U.S. on uh, Chinese intermediate goods. So it's absolutely not clear who is uh, hurt more. And, yeah. and if I, I may add to that, uh, imports into the U.S. relative to GDP just hit a new record. The protectionism's <laughs> everywhere except in the actual data. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we talk about the end of globalization. It really isn't apparent, or it doesn't show up in the data. And I'm with you. I think this codependency will continue for some time. But, but, but Tim, there's, there's, you know, there's some unique insights into that data mm -hmm. because um, the, the reason why there was such an uplift in, in the most recent annual data so front running, was I agree in with some preparation for what was going to happen so that, in fact, supply chains could move. And I do think the longer this goes... Um, the more risk there is that permanent changes in supply chains are effectuated. And companies are thinking about this every day now because people who run businesses can't make decisions month to month to month to month. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Supply chains are complicated. You have to make sometimes five and 10 year commitments um, to, to manufacturing and shipping, shipping lanes. And as a result, this is exactly the risk, which I'm, I'm hoping is part of the heat that gets turned up here recognizing that both sides will not get everything they want, um, but there needs to be an agreement. But that doesn't mean the trade deficit's gonna go away, it just moves to other locations, yeah, right? Fair. It's Vietnam, it's Malaysia, it's Bangladesh, other places. So we just move it around rather than being concentrated with respect to one particular country. Yeah, I think there are two layers of the issue here. The first mm -hmm. one, will the value chain, global value chain between China and United States, plus a lot of Asian countries will have a lot of the uh, input and also the intermediary goods there, will all this value chain will be disrupted? in the short run, also in the media run. And also, what I read from the uh, economists, the answer is partly yes. And they said that maybe this uh, abruption, also this uh, leaving from China will 
happen very quickly and overnight. But not today, but will happen eventually. So I, I, I'm not sure it's a, uh, if they will happen because you, it happened, you know. Yeah, you know. it happens already. We yeah. invest in a lot of companies that are uh, manufacturer for the world, uh, but based in China. Listen, before the trade war, there was always constant adjustment about how to optimize the supply chain uh, that is beneficial for all economies. China has started to move some of the manufacturing capacities to a low cost area. Vietnam and Thailand already. This started three years ago while getting rid of some excess capacity. Uh, and, and then also moving some of the more advanced manufacturing processes, technologies to markets like US. We invested in a company uh, that started in China, that's the world's largest uh, fiberglass manufacturer, best processes. U.S. is the largest export market, and they moved the factory to South Carolina, yes. invested $300 million. We invested, you know, with the company. So there was a lot of, you know, sort of gradual optimization based on the global order. And uh, what happens with the trade war is exactly what you described, uh, a disruption. Yeah. Mm. And it is causing a lot of chaotic, reactive, unplanned activity. And I think the um, harm of that is showing now. You know, we have examples where, you know, suppliers to U.S. that are, you know, uh, uh, invested in factory before in, let's say, Dongguan area in Guangzhou. You know, Guangzhou, by the way, oh, Guangdong makes, what, 80% of the world's smartphone. Now they are moving a lot of these to Vietnam in a hurry, only to discover there's not enough skilled labor <laughs> waiting there to receive this. Yeah. But, but so, maybe the, the, the reason of this kind of the uh, moving from China to, to other Asian places, not only for the trade disputes, but because of the rising costs. Well, that was so the part natural. I said. It yeah. should happen, but it happens in a planned, gradual way where it actually has the effect of a spreading the wealth yes. to areas, mm -hmm. according to a theory. Disruption is very harmful, and, and, and it's going to show up in consumers' cost. When they go to a store in the U.S., to buy a phone, it will be costing more. Yeah. Uh, so, so we're going through the second sort of phase of a cycle. So hopefully that will add a yeah. bit of pressure yeah, to politicians so, on both sides. Yeah. So the question here is that if this uh, kind of uh, global value chain uh, well, a disruption happens. It is happening now, but will continue to happen in a much bigger scale. Then China can accommodate this kind of the change oh, okay. by the consumption and the domestic market, uh, domestic market, market by ourselves. Well, I, I, I well, first of all, I, I think there will be deal, right? Uh, because you know, President Trump measures the success of his own policy by the rise and fall of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, <laughs> and. The signal from Wall Street is unmistaken. Right? Whenever you have some you know, difficulties with the trade negotiation, stock prices began to drop on you know, Wall Street. Whenever you have some success, you know, stock prices rises. So that indication is so strong, I, I believe it, it, is, uh, uh, you know, it is in uh, uh, the administration's interest to, to have a deal. Now, to your question, uh, um, uh, I mean, China uh, is slowing down, right? Because consumption, you know, because uh, uh, export and so forth. But as I said yesterday, China has enough policy tools to cushion this slowdown, uh, both on the monetary side as well as the uh, fiscal uh, side. Uh, so I don't worry about you know the short-term prospect of the Chinese economy. If anyone worries too much, um, I <laughs> I can tell you don't don't worry too much. Uh, China has enough policy tools to generate uh, growth in the short term, uh, but. What's more important when you look at China, you still, you know, the more important thing is that does China stop reform, mm -hmm. right, in the process of trying to, you know, counter, slow down the economy? And on that aspect, the answer is no, because China continues to move reform forward. And just, uh, you know, yesterday, the Chinese highest authority uh, uh, approved a plan from CSRC, which I work, uh, to launch a, a new science and technology uh, board in the Shanghai Stock Exchange. 
And this is very significant what we call supply side reform, because such a board would allow a great amount of uh, uh, technology firms to get an early listing uh, in the Chinese stock market, to get financed uh, with equity capital rather than debt capital, right, to fuel their uh, future growth. And given all these manpower and you know, capital in China, you will see uh, a boom of technologies in China in the coming years. And that should supply a lot of you know, growth uh, to the economy. And that's why I said you know, I'm quite optimistic on the medium to long term uh, basis about the Chinese economy. Since the, uh, uh, this board has been ratified, would you please shed more lights on the uh, uh, details of this board, more uh, a kind of uh, requirements and also uh, some other issues? As, uh, well, as, as first of all, I'm, I'm not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, and to this audience, this is not, you know, these details are not that of interest to them. Suffice it to say that uh, it will allow you know, a much earlier listing, right? much earlier public listing uh, by the uh, technology companies uh, in the Chinese stock market. Uh, at this point, right, any company uh, in China who wants to list needs to have a three-year consecutive profit. And not only just profit, you know, the profit has to reach a certain amount. So that prevented right, a lot of you know, technology companies from got, getting uh, listed and, and get financed through the public market. And, and we will address this issue, right? It was the Science and Technology Board. Uh, so uh, it will be a great engine for you know, technology companies in China. Yeah, that's why, uh, yeah, please. I, I just want to comment on, this is a significant event in <laughs> the ever evolving and growing uh, uh, Chinese capital market. The uh, significant about this time, uh, that has never stopped, but this time, it, this is largely based on a registration mm. system versus you make an application yeah, waiting for a system. CSS. So it's approval. a milestone, actually. So it reflected after many years of preparation. You remember, China doesn't know, we didn't know what the stock was before 1992. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's how long the history is. That really reflected this you know, Chinese phenomenon that, that says development set up the better rule and more development when everybody's ready, let's get an other set of rules. So this is very significant to us. Not only technology, that's a policy uh, orientation, but also for companies and, and the underwriters for the first time, carry the responsibility of truthful disclosure and be accountable for that. And, and removing the burden from the government officials being you know, the policeman trying to catch a thief. Uh, <laughs> So they will establish the rule and require people to disclose truthfully. So I think that's very, very significant. Re, you know, reflect the exact point that Mr. Fang just said. It's a reform. Yeah. And, and, and also, you know, I, I think that's you know, um, an ongoing process. And also, uh, and China is also you know, opened up the economy and at a very rapid rate, right? you know, the financial sector as well as the <laughs> manufacturing sector. So both reform and opening up continue at, at, at an accelerated rate. Uh, and that gives you know, us a lot of confidence in the Chinese economy going forward. I think, I think everyone is so optimistic about the Chinese economy, but I think we also do need to uh, face some real issues. Um, I think there's an excessive focus on the debt levels and the slowing growth rate. I really don't, I think these are symptoms, okay? Mm -hmm. They're not the real cause of, uh, of the issues or uh, the potential. I think one of the key reasons, and uh, both of you have touched upon, which is the financial system. And the key challenge in the Chinese economy today is how do you allow resources, whether it's credit or loans, to flow to the more productive areas of the economy? Essentially, the types of reform you're saying is one of many type of reforms that need to, that need to, be, to be done. Productivity growth in China in the last 10 years have been very, very, very low. And the reason is the, the fiscal stimulus after 2009 has caused a misallocation of resources going to low productive areas. So what we're essentially saying is how do we unleash the latent potential and latent dynamism of the private sector, of the household, and of the technology sector? Because there are plenty of things to be optimistic about. Services is rising, service productivity is rising, but unless you 
kind of flow, make the conduit of savings and investment and resource flows into the right part of the sector, we can always be optimistic and say there's long-term long growth potential, but it will never really be realized. May, may, may I just echo that? I think you're absolutely right. I think of China as a stock and flow problem. The stock of debt is huge. Uh, you know, I don't know what percentage is non-performing, non-commercially viable, but it doesn't matter if the flow is much better, and the flow has to go to productive enterprises that earn their cost of capital with high productivity. And so far, we've seen marginal uh, capital flows, credit flows, still going to SOEs, need to make sure that those flows go to the productive enterprises, either through capital markets or ensuring the banks can make true credit uh, uh, commercially based decisions. If the flow, f if you fix the flow, the stock fixes itself over time. Yeah, exactly. But, but, as, yeah, but as the banking system is liberalized, and that's a key component of the opening up yeah. of the Chinese economy, then global competition will, in fact, demand that. Yeah, you're part of the solution, yeah. Glenn. Will demand. Right. No, no, I believe it. You're bringing in technology. I mean, as much as, much as, as, much as uh, this conversation is interesting, if there's not good things to invest in, we're not going to invest. Right. Um, and there is a very clear market clearing return that has to be available by banks in order to lend, international banks in order to lend, businesses in order to invest, third party investors in order to find companies to invest in, and the capital finds good places to go. It just has to be allowed to go there. Right, yeah. Right. just to add to the point about optimism, uh, listen, China has the world's best digital infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about you know, number of netizens, uh, the smartphones that they're holding, time they're spending, things they do online, offline, and with their phones. Um, and, and they're still advancing at a faster pace than the rest of the world. China also has a very clear policy focus on developing and, and better people's life. And, uh, and then China uh, has gotten uh, to have the world's largest middle income consumer group. Mm -hmm. All of that uh, is still there. Um, and, and I want, also wanted to add, I noticed in here, the foreign capital actually started to notice potential slowdown in the States and, and uh, started to look at data and, and, and regain their interests. Mm -hmm in the ongoing Chinese development. Yeah. So the capital is shifting a little bit, but more importantly, China has a lot of capital. It's not like 10 years ago where you know, China relies on foreign capital a lot. China now actually <laughs> is trying to optimize its economic structure so it could present new opportunities that attract capitals mm -hmm. from both world and, and, and China. Uh, in that case, this next topic you want to cover, digital economy, is just very appealing. So you have a situation where there's new drivers that is built on the infrastructure, large consumer, yeah. and a clear policy orientation. So there's, there's yeah. quite a bit of things to be hopeful. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm I, just I, hoping that this hopefulness could be turned into confidence yeah. and action. Yeah, I think John is right that digitalization are uh, uh, exerting a lot of the uh, big driver for China's long-term economic growth. But still, at this moment, digitalization of China, or we call it a new economy, is small. It amounts to 10% to 30%, uh, depending on the different kind of the uh, framework of calculating. So it is still small. But as to the huge part of the old economy, and, and I think Ke Yu is right, the efficiency is an issue, and the rising ICOR is an issue, and the uh, declining uh, output from the uh, input is an issue. Actually, uh, we, uh, we will spend, we will, um, we will accumulate three dollars debt when we produce one dollar of the GDP. So mm -hmm. it's an issue. Right. The issue here is that the uh, SOE and also private sector, because private sector uh, can grow faster and uh, have bigger uh, uh, bigger efficiency and higher efficiency, but at the same time, they uh, receive less resources. So I think it's an yeah. issue. It, it, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, Kuyu has a very good point. I mean, we have to allocate our resources better, right? To let the you know, resources to flow into the more productive sectors. But how can you do that? You know, you have to accelerate market-based reform. Indeed. There's That's no other way of doing that. And if you observe, you know, the Chinese history of economic reforms, whenever Economic growth rate slows down, reform speeds up. And that's the truth in China. 
So you see reform being speeded up now. And it helps with the U.S. pressure on trade. You know, it will make China accelerate. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to say that. <laughs> that's the exact point I was making. We're so interdependent. Uh. Sooner or later, you know, we'll discover that just to win alone requires, you know, the other party to accept that by having something for themselves. A clear example, we talk about the reform a lot. It's actually very, very clearly stated uh, that Chinese reform um, is very linked with opening up. Mm. Why opening up? Learn and sometimes be forced <laughs> to activate the internal change because change always have resistance. Yeah, so why the Ke Yu said it's a strategic gift. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I believe that um, it's, China's worst nightmare is really an almighty president, an American president with convening power and able to strengthen allies, um, and then really cutting China out of the global supply chain. But really the question is out there, is it actually possible? Is a real divorce, disentanglement actually possible? It would require a lot of coordination of many, many different countries. And so uh, I think that, that, that's a question to, to reckon yeah. with. But let, let me um, just, uh, I just, something just occurred to me uh, when you said, there's data, there's argument, they have zero correlation, so we're not doing facts-based arguments uh, more and more so. Um, that's really depressing, but I am actually seeing some uh, uh, great evidence uh, suggests that maybe reasoning will come back soon. <coughs> I'll give you an example. So uh, one of the uh, interesting things that happened uh, in the last period is in the middle of all this pessimism is that Tesla mm -hmm. opened its largest factory in Shanghai. Yeah. 100% owned. Okay, I didn't hear anybody talking about forced technology transfer and things like that. But this is actually um, after China in the last year or so suggested that that market, which is the largest market both by size and growth still, would not see a combusting engine but in year 2025. All of a sudden, all incumbent companies, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, took their you know, uh, development project out of the lab and, and, and invested in China. The point I'm trying to make is here, we talk about sustainability, right? I was in a session yesterday People talk about how to be responsible for sustainability. China, by the way, is leading in many areas. Ten years ago, when I was here, officials representing China are arguing about, give us some runway. Let us pollute a bit more in terms of you know, uh, CO2 quota. Today, you don't hear anything from Chinese officials talking about that. They were saying, oh, we know that's harmful now. Because if you stayed in Beijing ten years ago, you breathe the air. Today, they actually are leading this. But to do this, <coughs> they're actually setting policy frontier in a way where it's actually guiding all participants to advance quicker. Right. Uh, so again, this is an example of collaboration yeah. between two systems. <coughs> and it's better for everybody. Yeah, maybe they, I think Xinhai is right that the biggest optimism comes from that the opening up always work with the reform by China itself. So if we look at the opening up this time and China has admitted that we were opening quickly and more and more in scale and in the different industries. And also at the same time, now China has negotiation with the United States. And also China is talking about the participating reform of the WTO. But if we think about the reform of the WPL, it also relates to China's internal reform. I have to mention SOE reform again, and also the subsidy issue, and also the uh, um, uh, kind of uh, industrial policy issue, and also the uh, development uh, country status issue. So maybe you can talk a little bit on the uh, development country status on the uh, WTO reform platform. Do you think China is still a developing country here, or maybe more than that, China should graduate or gradually or something, any one of you? Well, it, it's, it's for sure true that 
China wants to uphold the multilateral system, no doubt, um, support globalization. And I think China will make uh, trade concessions or, let's say, improve its uh, international practices for the benefit of the multilateral system. Now, one has to be aware that this kind of system is established decades ago in the 80s, and things have changed a lot. You know, you need to give more voices to emerging markets, but also the, the system also uh, states that there will be a lot of service imports of developing countries from advanced yeah, countries. Right. You know, China is now opening up the financial services. So in that way, they are going to be importing a lot more of these kind of, uh, you know, service goods. So I think that um, China wants to uh, uphold this. But I want to also point to the fact that the tides are shifting, even as we are speaking. For the first time in decades, in 2018, China has recorded the first current account deficit. Yeah. Okay, that is a very important, uh, let's say, milestone, because what that means is that China can act as a source of aggregate demand in the world economy when aggregate demand in Western Europe or the U.S. fails. It is the first time that is becoming, turning from a producer to a consumer, and you need a strong Chinese economy to help sustain the global economy, especially when a recession is potentially in sight. I, I, my, 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 the only comment I would add is, and it is this evolution to Chinese consumption that brings to bear the entire suite of economic opportunities and challenges. So there will be times when the consumers consume less and GDP grows slower. And, there, and then central governments are going to have to take action in order to address that. And that's going to be much more dynamic than it ever has been. And I think this is, this is the... the an entire globe integrated in a way that we all of a sudden are noticing that when the Chinese consumer doesn't consume or businesses in China are having um, confidence challenges, look what happens in, in Germany. Germany has a tough fourth quarter and there's lots of factors for that. But it, it can't be missed that um, the slowing of Chinese growth is impacting the world for this exact reason. So all of a sudden, we get back to where we started, which is th the concept of of re-engineering supply chains away from um, China completely and having two isolated behemoths oh. that go about their business independently is just not realistic. Um, and in fact, um, both, both countries absolutely need success economically globally. Uh, and so therefore, we're going to be mutually dependent on a go-forward basis. Yeah, just to, to add that point, I absolutely am convinced of that. We invested in US technology companies that benefited greatly because the Chinese market, and we work as an example, uh, and uh, we invested in Hollywood movie studio, uh, benefiting from the storytelling because of Chinese market, but also Chinese yes. content that the world wanted to understand. I, I just don't know how you could reverse that trend. That's not about trade, not about agreement. It's about human you know, demands. Uh, and, and, and so sooner or later, I think more success story like Tesla, which reflected, you know, advantages creating win-win, reflected China as its market being so powerful, attractive, with established rules just by, you know, serving its own customer and people who want to participate will follow that. That's new rule making. So I think, you know, you're going to see more and we're going to see more financial services companies from, you know, U.S. and Europe coming in China, establish their wholly owned subsidiary. They will follow the rule. They will influence the rulemaking. And that's how it ought to be going. So I think after this first round of confrontational, hopefully people will have yeah. you know, you know, more connect, reasoning. Connecting your two points, our institutions, the WTO, our politics are really still situated in a 20th century view of industrial America and industrial China. Manufacturing is less than 10% of the U.S. economy. Percentage of the workforce that in manufacturing has been dropping since the 1940s. We are an experienced economy, a, a services-based, and it, there's a great book entitled Capitalism Without Capital. It's about the role of intangibles, intellectual property. That is the 21st century. Yet our politics are still nostalgic about this day of walking into a factory and, you know, the dignity of working on a, on a factory floor, usually for people who've never been in a factory. <laughs> yeah. But we really need to move the conversation and the institutions, including the WTO, to a new 21st century it really talks about the role of data. That is the new oil of the 21st century. Yeah. Xinhai. Now, you mentioned the SOE, reform. right? Yeah. I would ask you know, John to talk about SOE. He's done a lot of SOE reforms in China. 
Yeah, we actually, the SOE investment opportunity uh, is a, a very vivid story of mm. sort of a development story of China. Uh, you know, one step at a time, and when you get to the higher ground, revamp the system and do the next one. When we, when we started 15 years ago, uh, China didn't know what it was buyout. And uh, a lot of SOEs were in big trouble, uh, and uh, they don't have easy access to capital. Your firm yes. was investing in gross capital, in venture capital, SOE was, oh, wow. But we thought that was the part of Chinese economy that's the largest base, and if you don't move that, you know, you don't move the rest of the economy. So it's an opportunity to do value-adding service, as, as we put it. Originally, we do buyout type. And, and as we actually learn, and we do the next level, which is more mixed ownership. Because the idea of private equity owning a company is, is the mean, not the end. The end is to make the company more competitive. Mm -hmm. So today we're at SOE restructuring 3.0 where we actually sometimes will sell back some of the share mm. that we own to large SOE because they've gotten to the point where there are other resources to bear. But under the same understanding of market-driven governance and the specialized team and, and the compete. And that's the ever-evolving. Uh, just to show that point, uh, Mr. Fang just raised, I, I, when I talked to my LP 15 years ago, they were saying, oh, it's great, but aren't you working in a way where, you know, every time you privatize an SOE, you have a less opportunity, and soon they'll all be gone, and you'll be dead. <laughs> I said, no, that's, that's just not true. First of all, it's not a priv about privatization. It's about, a, I created a word called marketization. Mm -hmm. You really wanted to grow the business by having the right governance. The other thing is that the Chinese companies or economy, and you know, it's gonna be um, following the Chinese social development. We always n knew there's always gonna be a great set of you know, SOEs, but the purpose is not to get rid of them. The purpose is that they are competitive. Today, that's but, exactly but, how it goes. By the way, John, how do you evaluate the uh, uh, corporate governance? in the SOE in China? Well, many dimensions, you know. Um, you know first of all, it, it's about uh, decision making. Uh, the company needs to have a purpose of working towards the benefit of shareholders, maximize value. Um, before, that's not separated from government agenda. So you put a board, the company is gonna be uh, you know, working towards the benefit of the shareholders. Secondly, uh, you wanted to have alignment of interest between managers, and shareholders and the stakeholders of other type. So it's all the routine things, but you just do it. And, and, and that's how it happens. And it's so doable, you, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is. So you think that yeah, uh, a corporate governance in the SOE is, is okay, sex to factory? Yeah, again, it goes rounds and rounds. You know, okay. Before, the, the government wanted to do this quicker and now there are some other you know, uh, elements that we have to consider. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that is now time for us to open the floor for invite our audience also join the discussion. And uh, uh, please uh, raise your hand if you have a question or comments and please identify who you are and uh, please join us. Hu Zong, I think it, you are the right person to join the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a question for you. Do you think Huawei's uh, future will be um, hampered by the uh, policies from the different countries, especially in the United States? Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> this is, <laughs> yeah, this is uh, really <laughs> no surprise to me. Yeah, because yeah, sorry, because I, I I was not here for the for the you know uh, previous uh, you know part of the the session. Yeah, but if you talk... But it's a new topic. <laughs> it's a really new topic. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, to, to just to share some of my you know humble uh, opinions on you know uh, what what has happened, not just uh, you know specific, specifically on uh, my company, but generally uh, in the market. So uh, um, yeah, uh, some points. Firstly, um, I would say. Um, yeah, we we've seen a lot of you know uh, um, 
changes in the market, right? <laughs> and we've seen, uh, yeah, uh, actually, you know, there has been some, you know, negative impact from the trade war to the to the economy. And yeah, we we are at the technology industry, and probably because we highly rely on the global supply chain, global ecosystem for innovation. So probably you know, you know we were you know, suffering <laughs> uh, the most right now. Yeah. Yeah, but if you put that into the big context of the you know restructuring of the economy, the redefining of the globalization, I would say that yeah, this is just like a event. Yeah, this is just like the weather. Yeah, so for the change of the weather, we probably could be, you know, in the approach like more reactive. But if you look at the globalization, if you talk about the, you know, digital transformation or the restructuring of the economy, I would say that's the concept of the climate change. So I think for the yeah. change of the weather and the change of the climate, we should take totally different approach. For the change of the weather, we can be reactive. However, for the change of the climate, we should be more proactive to get involved, to join the discussion, and to share our opinions to all the stakeholders. Yeah, yeah that's just some you know, humble yeah. opinions. Thank Sorry. you so much yeah. for the great input. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Question or comments? So back to all the uh, panelists, just uh, from the uh, view from the uh, uh, Ken, uh, and also uh, related to Huawei. And now, because the United States are taking a stance that they uh, just cut the uh, technology links between China and the United States, uh, at least in the military front and also in some other uh, sensitive parts, but as maybe leave the uh, uh, bigger parts also have the real connection. So uh, along this road, do you, how do you see the trends between China and the United States in terms of the technology competition? Do you think that the, it could mm. be uh, just a decoupled completely or it has to be weaved together? in the short run, in the medium run, also in the long run, in terms of technology. One really has to wonder that um, in the current environment, when US and China are producing and exporting very different things, that there are a huge amount of synergies to be you know, benefited from by trading, that when apples, you know, uh, they, they use low cost supply in China and their profits are going because of their innovation capacities, that there's so much synergy. And then China and US are still fighting over trade. It's not, it's not the trade patterns between, let's say, UK and US, in which case there will be more competition. There is no real head-on competition. However, when it comes to technology, that is a completely different issue, especially when we think about artificial intelligence, uh, where there are sectors where there could be first mover advantages, where clearly uh, pooling together bigger data and bigger markets might be beneficial. Um, this is a real potential for head-on-head -head, uh, competition. Now, I, I wonder whether whether to you know we should envision a world and that's divided into two. One part of the world is using the technological infrastructure and technological IT system of China, and the other part of the world is using a completely different IT system and technological infrastructure of America. That clearly has huge efficiency losses, but in this case, there is actual real competition as opposed to what we're experiencing today in terms of trade. Right, but I, I think it's important to just be clear that the political circumstance in the United States is unified on this topic. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it is unified on this topic that if there is not some um, sort of an agreement to uh, really um, closely pay attention to technological advancement, whether it is from the United States standpoint, state supported, or, or if it is protected in some way, um, the United States is, it's not Republicans versus Democrats. The United States is absolutely unified and they will, policies will be enacted in order to put even higher, higher uh, protective me mechanisms around technology issues in the United States. And we just went through a whole reform um, on our, all of our CPIUS legislation, Indeed. which really does govern the transfer of technology. And what landed um, was more protective, 
And if we don't begin to see progress, which is why I think Tim and I continue to be hopeful <laughs> that there's an agreement, because on many, most of these topics, it is not Republicans versus Democrats uh, when it comes to the technology issues. There is a very, very um, clear unified view for that. Well, now, which it, is um, pretty concerning, and I also think it's one of those things, it's not all facts-based, because uh, it involves a lot of projection based yes. on what you see, and what that unification um, has assumed is that a country like China, while it's rising economic power, is really run by the government in every aspect, including the so famous uh, the China, uh, China 2025. <laughs> you know, the irony is that if you go to China and talk to investors, business owners, even large companies, CEO, you know, they sort of saw that as one of the think tanks throughout the blueprints, you know, like many. And, and but then in uh, Washington, somehow it got into be the part of this is what China will do. Uh, yeah. So I think, you know, I saw more misunderstanding um, based on the old way of thinking. Yes. The old way of thinking US was thinking, you know, let's embrace China, WTO. China as it develops will be more and more like us, culturally, mm -hmm. socially, maybe even politically, which you know, was a sort of large assumption then. Yes. China, on the other hand, was benefiting from global trade, seeing you know, their lives being better. For the first time, they gained financial sort of um, power. And thinking about now we get to be respected. I, I don't see a lot of Chinese thinking about being a world power. They didn't, what, didn't know what that was <laughs> in terms, they were just, they're just trying to enjoy, you know, sort of the reason standard. Yeah. I agree. And so on China's side, on the other hand, there was a bit of exaggeration of now we have money and, and we could be powerful. So I think, you know, but that's natural. Uh, in experience on both sides. What we are saying now, as we have discussed, are facts based, yeah. both harmfulness and a success example, in reflection, hopefully, we'll see better, you know, system. Yeah, no, so back I mean, to technology. Point, yeah. Yeah. Glenn, you know, I think uh, you, know, you mentioned the reform of the CFIS process, right? So if the discontent is just about IPR protection, China will improve on that because China is becoming an innovative economy as well, so it needs IPR protection with itself. Now, if the um, motivation is, is kind of more sinister, right? It's like, uh, you know, China is a different country, we got to somehow put China down. Uh, that's, that's quite uh, dangerous in the sense that, uh, you know, it will be very costly for the United States Great. to begin with. And then China will obviously, you know, try to innovate as much, you know, even harder as you know, we've been doing. And, uh, you know, technolo uh, for a person like us, who perhaps are not, you know, technology people, but when I talk to the technology people in China, they're actually not afraid of. Because, you know, technological innovation in today's world is not that difficult. No. Yeah, you just put manpower, you put capital in, boom, you come up with new technologies. It's not that difficult, you know? and. Uh, so we will see. I, I think uh, you know, if, if the, you know, as I said, this, the motivation is somewhat sinister, uh, that's going to fail. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. The, the challenge for CFIUS is not just the US, it's the UK, it's Germany, it's Australia, it's Canada. There is a global movement in an effort to uh, filter or screen FDI for the perception that it's for technological transfer. And then there are export control regimes as well, which we have. So, it, it, unfortunately, the politics focus a lot on China, but having been on the CFIUS committee, there are a lot of countries out there that are trying to acquire U.S. technology <laughs> yeah. for maybe not always. Yeah, but, but, but maybe, but, but maybe. You haven't even mentioned about the Chinese safest. Yeah, yeah but, but right. maybe that's you know, just an so instance. So this assumption of one way yeah. is no, so yeah. temporary. Okay.
Yeah, but still, it, it, it could be a, a more incentive for China to innovate more by ourselves. So because the, uh, we have run out of the time, so I think we have think, to wrap up. I think Tim and I are hoping it's an incentive to reach yeah. a deal. Yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah, in the first place. Yeah, yeah we have to uh, wrap up now. I will ask you a very uh, interesting, maybe a little tough question. Uh, do you think the Thucydides uh, trap between China and the United States is true or not down the road in the next maybe uh, 20 years? And also before the uh, trade disruption erupted, uh, a lot of economists and also commentators forecast that China will become the uh, biggest economy in the world by 2030 or around 2030, and also with a, a huge and a very powerful technological cloud. At this situation, when the trade dispute and happens, do you think this will, um, um, the China's this kind of the forecast will become true, will become quicker or slower, and suicide dies is possible or not? Very quickly for every one of you, maybe Ke Yu first. It's too late. If the US wants to limit China's growth, even Chinese technology, technological growth, it should have been 10 years ago. Now it's too late. Yeah. I think the Thucydides, uh, Thucydides trap concept is very dangerous. Uh, you know, Once this is a general sentiment accepted by the public, the relationships quickly spiral. And what it will do is to stoke nationalism in both parts, which no, nobody really wants to see. And truculent US policy will not really, in the end, serve its purposes. I really don't think we should go down uh, that concept. Yeah. Glenn? I agree. Final word. I agree. <laughs> that was really good, so yeah. I agree. Team? Yeah, our fate is in our own hands, and we need enlightened leadership. Uh, you know, on what China looks like 20 or 30 years from now, I don't know. I don't believe in extrapolating in a linear fashion. I remember the 1980s, everyone said Japan was taking over the world, and it was, you know, it was all about Japan at the time. That was right before things blew up. So I don't know. Uh, probably, but it probably won't unfold in the way that we currently think. John? I think we've just gone through problem discovery phase where the easiest conclusion is that China against US, country against other country. What we're discovering, and soon I think we'll have consensus, what we're facing is human development together. Technology, you know, new world order. So we need to have a new world order. And before we have that, we're limited in our thinking with the old framework. That's where we are. So it's the sort of uh, uh, the darkest moment before dawn. Uh, I don't know why, uh, to Kyu's point, anybody, uh, China or U.S. included, or government people, uh, wanted to limit 1.4 billion's pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. and I don't know how that could be stopped. And that's what's going on for China in the last 40 years. Government played a role, but they're all what they are doing is to you know, re, you know unleash the power of people's desire to pursue happiness successfully. So I think that trend continues. Yeah. Well, um, let me offer my <laughs> interpretation. I, I think the U.S. remains a very innovative like, country. And if the U.S. continues to be very innovative, if, if it regains its confidence in its own system, then there's no suicide trap because right, you know, the U.S. is a very self-confident country. It doesn't have to be you know, behaving the way that it is behaving now. Uh, on the other hand, if somehow you know, the U.S. Uh, doesn't continue to innovate right, or slows down, uh, then there's no competition. Uh, so I, I don't think this you know, framework of suicide trap fits the US-China relation in this sense. And also uh, down the road, maybe um, global community with the shared interest and the shared faith shared future. will be yeah, shared future will be the real future. Okay, thank you so much. Thank Please join much. us thank with you. a big applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.